Thanks for listening to the Thyroid Fixer podcast with your host, me, Dr. Amy Horneman, aka The Thyroid Fixer, functional medicine practitioner, hormone and weight loss expert. We're talking all things thyroid, hormone and health related in order to empower, educate and transform you. So if you're ready to get your life back, let's get started. All right, Dr. Lauren, we're going to do this. I cannot wait to talk about mold with you because I know you have your own story. You and I are longtime colleagues. You've been on the podcast before, but this is a topic like we shared about at KetoCon, having many dinners together there. It's, it's one that I see and hear about from my patients and audience alike where they get really confused about the the topic of mold and what it can do to the body, what it can do to their thyroid, what it can do to their hormones, how it's playing a role with a lot of their symptoms. And and I think you and I, this is going to be just a kick-ass conversation because we're going to show both sides of the story. We're going to show how sometimes it can be overblown. And I use that term very loosely, but it can be almost overemphasized in the functional space. Because maybe somebody, you know, totally specializes in mold and then they truly believe in their heart of hearts that you get rid of mold and the whole body is better and you don't need anything else. And then you have the other side where I believe you fall, where, listen, you went through your own hell with mold and it did affect your health, but you're not going to just cure that and get rid of mold and then you know, you no longer have cancer and you no longer have a thyroid problem and the world opens up and you get a better job. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't right. cure everything yeah, by addressing all. So anyways, thank you. Thank you so yes. much for jumping back on the Thyroid Fixer podcast and let's talk mold. So this is going to be a game changer for you and you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the fixer line is metabolism fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight, that need help in the weight loss department, that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism. And that might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there, you know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight, add in Metabolism Fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2, which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, We have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, ooh, yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form. So you can drink it through your day. It's going to flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some Metabolism Fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. 
super pumped to be here. And yes, I guess I, it's so interesting that you talk about it being like an overblown or just a blown up topic in general. People are talking about mold, not even just overblown, but when I was going through mold, like I guess 2018 is when it started to come onto my radar. It was still like not really being talked about actually. And so, and there really weren't many practitioners talking about it. So it's just crazy the past like several years, how that has changed. And it's interesting during 2020, I actually saw a lot of like flares, like mold, like symptoms for people um, because people were home more. So I think it's also becoming just like something that is on people's radars, at least in the functional space. I can't always speak to the conventional realm because my lens is very much in this world right now. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to dive in with you. Nice. Well, you have to start with your story because it's a good one. So yeah. yeah, well, my story with mold, just like it really, again, was not something ever on my radar, except for like having heard it just through the grapevine of being a practitioner myself. I had been working as a functional med practitioner since like 2014, uh, 13, 14. It's kind of when I started my business. And so it was usually like the eighth line of something that I would like think about for other people hearing the word like mold. It's like, maybe that could contribute. Or I used to just think like it's gray or purple fuzz or green fuzz, like, or like maybe black that you see on the pictures, but like, what's the big deal? Just like clean it or like, get rid of it and move on. Bleach I that shit, right? Exactly. Just really bleach, bleach it. <laughs> Definitely don't bleach it. If that's the one thing you take from this podcast, that will spread those spores. But yeah, it really was not something on my radar or nor did I think it could be like a really a, a huge health issue. And so I was living in a home 2000, I think 17 is when I moved into that home. And here in Austin, it's a 10 year old home. So not that old, like relatively new and in a neighborhood that I loved and never again on my radar, but gradually, as I look back at my health timeline, my health began to go downwards, not upwards of anything. And over the course of about a year, I just started developing all sorts of symptoms that I really hadn't had before. And it started a lot with my gut that tends to be like my Achilles heel. And what I find with mold is a lot of times it will show up in areas or highlight and exacerbate areas where we may be more prone to being unwell, at least at first. So some people may feel more like neurological symptoms. Some people may feel more gastrointestinal. Some people it's just over hormone imbalances, weight gain, like the list will go on because it can affect every body system. But for me, it showed up in my gut. So I had like a ton of workup done got diagnosed with like colitis, never had had that before celiac, which I kind of was aware of having had that. And just like chronic IBS and SIBO SIBO actually, I think will oftentimes be diagnosed in the functional space, sometimes from practitioners without considering mold, which is a layer to add to that puzzle. SIBO is a lot of times a symptom, not actually a root cause. And so all that to say like the gut stuff, and then just all of a sudden started developing all sorts of like you know, diabetes was one thing I was diagnosed with, um, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's lupus, like symptoms, anemia, tons of micronutrient deficiencies with like chronic illness. Then we go down the Lyme trap and or like Lyme rabbit hole rather. So getting diagnosed with Lyme and co-infections and then eventually like mast cell activation syndrome. And then my body's just like in a flare state all the time. My food intolerance list grew tremendously to the point where I was eating only like five foods because all my body could handle. Sweet potatoes would make my blood sugar go from 80 to 180 to 80 within 20, 30 minutes, or like just finished, had too much oxalates. You like, you know, the list goes on in that realm as well, but still no one could really figure this out. And I was going from doctor to doctor and you know, thankfully within my functional med background, like I did have an inside to a ton of practitioners to bounce things off of in that realm. And then also went down the conventional, like, so I was going down these two parallel paths and no one could really pinpoint what was going on. Again, mold was something super, just not that well addressed or talked about. And so even in my functional medicine and practitioners, I like flew out to California to see a practitioner. I'm based here in Austin. Uh, that was like top in the field and they never went down that rabbit hole <laughs> as well or to like think it was mold. And the thing that got me to think down like something inside me highlight mold, I was in, I guess that spring, we had just turned on our AC for the spring here in Austin. And so like, if you know anything about mold, like that AC and or heat, just when you transition, a lot of times we'll kick up spores and either of those systems in your house 
if the spores happen to be there. So we turn on the AC and I'm like swimming in toxic soup by this point. Go to bed that night and wake up at 2 a.m. feeling like I'm having a heart attack, just like gasping, chest pains, clenching my chest. Thankfully, there's like an ER down the street. Thankfully, I would I say that because I went there multiple times over the course of this past year. They knew me very well. I was like that girl. Um, but I just didn't feel well. And obviously when you feel like you're having a heart attack, that's where you're going to go. So I go there and the doctor walks in, they do the diagnostic workup, the EKGs, they send me in for a scan. He comes in and he says, Lauren, you know, there's times conventional medicine will fail you. This is one of them. And he said, I just, I have no idea what's going on. And he's like said, this must just be like some severe asthma attack you're having. He gives me like a steroid and then a bronchial treatment. And it's kind of like, you know, clean up shop. We're going to send her on our way. And when I heard that laying there in that hospital bed, something inside me just flickered mold. <laughs> and I honestly think it was a message from up above because that like it really had never been a word anyone had said to me. Yep. But so I go home that night and that next morning, just get on the phone, call a local mold inspector who happens to be the son of a fellow functional medicine doc here in town. And he comes out and he does a type of mold sampling at the time, like that is actually the least sensitive. So he does just an airborne sample and he does an inspection of the house. What I know now from uh, testing is like, that is, if you have a problem, uh, like airborne is gonna be what detects, like it has to be a big problem basically for airborne to detect it. And it detected it. And then he takes pictures, he goes, he does the inspection and there's black all in that HVAC system. And so just this whole past year, I've been breathing in all these toxic mold spores. And then he finds like some water damage in the sidewall, just like kind of see like what happened. And we had had like some flooding here in Austin, like I guess a year before where every time it would rain, I would just see some leaking like from this window, but never thought of anything of it. I'm, I was not a homeowner. I was a home renter and never had to like manage a home in that capacity. So all that to say, like once that, like uh, that lid was taken off, it was just like, wow, mayday signs going off. And I knew what I was dealing with. And then you just go down the whole like mold, like cyclone of just like everything, like walking away, like a fire had happened by the end of it, because I was so sick to everything sick to myself. Even like I would go to bed at night, just like smelling my hair could not handle it. There was mold, like all in my body and then mold on just everything I owned. I got rid of everything. Um, like again, a fire had happened uh, including my car, including my just like computer that I was working on. And are you serious? Uh, you got phone. rid of everything. Yes. Like everything. I just could not handle it. My body was just, and at that point, my immune system was so in fight or flight. My gut was so just, I say insufficiency dysbiosis, like just not enough healthy gut bugs there to help me with my defense. And it was just, yeah, super stressed. And so all that to say is it was a very long climb out of that because if anyone has been through mold or known someone that's gone through mold at that level, by that time that you were in fight or flight, it's very challenging a lot to find a place like that you can be in like not fight or flight because you are like my immune system, my mast cell activation center had me reactive, like chemical sensitivities galore. So even if I would like go into a new rental, like new paints, new carpets, like everything just did feel like toxic soup, except for the great outdoors. So there were many nights that I slept on like balconies of apartments I was renting or slept in my new car. Like once I got a new car and um, I moved a total of 15 times during 2020 alone. And this was just from like Airbnb to couch to uh, like friend's house and just places that I would rent and walk away like two days later, cause I couldn't handle it. And walking away from leases where they'd make me pay anywhere from 6,000 to $10,000 just to get out of a lease. I had just signed because that was in writing. You have to pay two and a half months of rent. And so I just felt like a pouring piggy bank by this time and just feeling so stripped. And it is such a spiritual journey too, of just like feeling like you are taken down to the studs internally. And all along the way though, something inside me, and this is like my human design, it was just like, I'm going to figure this out. Like I, I saw, I was going to get through it on the other side and I knew it was going to be a roller coaster. And I knew this greatly just because of my own 
health journey prior to going through mold. I had struggled for 15 years with chronic anorexia that I almost died from. And same kind of thing, like systems-based treatment where doctors would say, there's nothing that's going to help you or could cure you. And so, and having like that same grit mindset or remembering that, and that is what got me through that journey. And so I really held on to that. And that, that would be an encouragement for anyone listening to this and know that know someone going through this or that is going through it themselves is like, it all is about biology of belief to start. Like if you don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, yeah. like you're going to stay stuck. And that is something I have a such amazing people that came into my life over the course of those years too. But one in particular, her name's Suzanne and she's called the mold canary or mold whisperer here in Austin is what she's known as. And she actually has diagnosed like several of my functional medicine doctor friends with mold before they knew they had it. Like as a patient, she was like, this is what you're going through. So she's like in her seventies and very well known. And we call her the whisperer because she will walk through like homes uh, with people and she'll be able to see, like, say there's mold, there's not mold here or like walk through a new building and even like be like, there's mold in the sidewall and the builders like, no, this is brand new. They'll cut out the wall. Sure enough, it's there. She can just feel. And she's kind of taught me that, that skill over the years, like karate kid style. But all that to say, like one day I asked Suzanne while I was in the thick of it, like, what do you see is the difference in people that get over this versus people that don't. And she just always would tell me like, Lauren, it's the people that believe that they're going to be well. And they see life on the other side are the ones that get through. And like, she's been doing this work for like 40 years now, 40, 50 years since like going through it herself. And so that was super encouraging to have that person in my life. And something that with my, the work I do with my patients now to just like having been someone that's been through it, I hope to be an encouragement for them, but it is a very toxic world, not just like overtly going through mold, but once you are like diagnosed with mold, it, you can easily put on that Sherpa bag. And we were talking a little bit about this yesterday and like going down the rabbit holes of like Facebook groups that are all about mold or like whatever communities um, or blog articles you read and you just really begin to identify with mold. And in a way, the more like you hold on to it, the more it holds on to you. Yeah. And so as I've walked away from it more and more, the more I've healed. So to the point where I'm able to now go into places that have mold, I can detect it. I still have my canary nose, but my body does not react in the same way, fight or flight. And there's been a lot of internal healing as well that's gone on, but all that to say, there's a little synopsis, a long, a long winded synopsis of my story and really just some of my passion, explain some of my passion about this topic. Oh my God, but that's crazy. And you know, what, what I was thinking as you were telling us that is how many stories are out there from, you know, world renowned practitioners like yourself that we don't hear when you're going through it. We're looking at Lauren now and she looks amazing and she's happy and, you know, your skin's good and your hair's good right. and you're nice and lean and athletic, but we don't see you when you're in the depths of it, like you went through. Right. So that is just, I mean, Lauren, you've told me your story before, but never to that level, to that extent. And that is just absolutely crazy moving 15 times in, in 2020 or 19. Yeah. I mean, that's insane. So you found out it was mold. Let's actually go back because you said that you had figured out or maybe through this process that it started affecting all of your, you were told you were diabetic. I mean, how does that even happen to look at you? I would, diabetes would be the farthest I know, diagnosis right? that I would even grab. So yeah, I mean, again, mold will, it's just like a highlighter. It's like it's an interesting paradigm. I've learned since going through mold and on the back end, there's also a framework called German new medicine. And I call it like gut brain, how the gut brain works. But I think a lot of times it's how dis-ease in our lives and balance in our lives can show up as imbalance in the body. And so the context of mold can happen a lot of times because there's other stressors in our life going on that make us more susceptible to the mold we're breathing in. Okay. I'll give you a really simple example. And this would be from a food intolerance angle, but say little Johnny is eight years old. He eats a PB and J every single day for lunch. He loves his PB and J been eating it for five years. And then all of a sudden he starts to develop like skin breakouts, hives when he eats this and a lot of gut issues. So he gets worked up and it's just concluded that he has a gluten intolerance and a peanut allergy. He just needs to cut out those foods. However, when we do the timeline history of little Johnny and what was happening prior in his life, prior to like getting sick with the PB&J, we realize 
He was eating a PB and J when he witnessed his mom and dad have an all out fight that led to his dad walking out and eventually their divorce. And the way that the limbic system works is it locks that in. And so it begins to correlate PB and J with stress. And so anytime that little Johnny eats PB and J is when his little body gets stressed. And so I have found the similar correlation with mold and like why it would highlight in different areas of the body. So for example, with gut, it's starting for me there, indigestible conflicts, a lot of times will show up in the gut. So what in my life at that time was going on that was indigestible? And my brain was processing this. And 95% of our thinking is subconscious thinking. So it's like, we're not even aware of these thoughts. It's just downloads and we're having like 50 to 80,000 thoughts a day, like whatever the statistic is, but there's a lot going on in that brain of ours. And so at that time, I mean, I was working 12 hours a day in my practice. I was working out a lot to like offset a lot of my like personal stress, I was sleeping four hours a night. Like, I mean, there's not much time in a day to do other things, but that in and of itself, like was like fight or flight Lauren. And so that was going on in the background while I'm living in this home with mold. So a lot of times people also ask, why is it one can live in a house with mold and get sick and the, their partner doesn't get sick or their family doesn't get sick. And I was living in a house with two roommates. Neither of them were sick. They may have like allergies, headaches, et cetera, that they, it could be from mold. It, it probably was, but it just was not to the degree of the sickness that I got. And it just, a lot of times depends on that threshold of stress. And so all that to say is it can highlight, mold can highlight different areas of the body. A lot of times also because at a subconscious level, there's certain stressors and the brain is mapped for a thousand different conditions, depending on specific stressors. So like skin issues, a lot of times are related to like an attack conflict. This could be self-attack, like me being the hardest on myself, being in my head. It could be related to being bullied in middle school. Think about how many teenagers have acne and it's like your skin is your protective mechanism. So that's how it's showing up. Um, thyroid issues can be related a lot of times to a morsel conflict. So something that maybe I can't swallow or that I feel stuck in. So it really, it's very deep. Hashimoto's is an autoimmune condition. So that's like self-devaluation conflict is a lot of times at a root of that. And if you can think about so many more women have autoimmune diseases in general. So many more right. women have thyroid issues in general. Who tends to be harder on themselves <laughs> comparatively? I mean, generally speaking, yeah, I would say a lot of the guys I know in my life tend to be more confident and more egocentric <laughs> than right. us women. And so it's, I think that's also a reason why correlation with mold can show up as different systems, but there's really no system that the mold will not touch. And again, it can be a lot of times our Achilles heel that'll highlight, be highlighted first. I will say one more thing on that too, is like, you know, weight, weight gain is a lot of times a, a symptom of like thyroid issues or of mold toxicity in the body. And I had actually a lot of weight imbalance as well. Like for me, my like default, just from my history, my eating disorder is weight loss when I'm under stress okay. and it, my body goes into catabolic mode as opposed to anabolic mode, even without like any, I was eating like trying to eat 3000 calories a day and still losing weight. And so, and a lot of times like folks will be on the flip side, like, Hey, I'm eating so pristine and clean, or maybe not eating much at all. And I'm still gaining weight. Why is that? And it is because your body is in a fight or flight mode. A lot of times when exposed like uh, to this biotoxin, the mold spore, which actually, if you do look at history, like research, it's used as a, a, bi a weapon, a biological warfare weapon, uh, right. these mold spores. And so that's how your body sees it too. Interesting. So why is it that, and this is going to kind of piggyback off what you just said about how some people are more sensitive. Do we know the why? Why is it that that I can be exposed to mold because I'm sure I have been right. I, I'm yeah. living in a house that was built in 1976, but like you said, I mean, chances are pretty darn good that even if you're in a new house, you could still have mold. Mm. I once built a house and I remember within the first year or so, I mean, we were finding mold, black mold in the garage and it was a brand new house. So why is it that some people are more, susceptible, assuming that we have all been exposed, which we most likely have been. Yeah, a hundred percent. And we can circle back to like actually old builds are better than new builds sometimes because of the way we are building nowadays. It all comes to like health is an inside job. And so not only like we've been talking about stress, like how unique that is to every person in seasons of life, because there is a hundred percent chance that I lived in mold, like 
if you've ever been to college and lived in a dorm, you've lived in mold. And so yeah. <laughs> like, it's just like being exposed to mold throughout my life. And like, why did I get sick at that specific time? So it was the perfect storm. Yes. And one's like constitution internally from a detoxification pathways perspective, and then a gut microbiome perspective, like how stealth is your terrain and your gut bacteria, because your gut microbes and your gut alone is where your immune system is. And that's your defense system. And so if you've got uh, insufficiency dysbiosis, not enough healthy gut bugs, or just an imbalance of gut bacteria in your gut already preceding that, mold exposure, like you are going to be more susceptible because your good gut bug army is not there to defend you. And so, you know, on the back end of a journey of like so many chronic diets that I was on for years and my eating disorder, like my gut terrain was already wrecked. And so, I mean, my mold journey just really highlighted my love of the gut even more. And then from a detoxification pathways perspective. So like methylation is a hot topic or has been in the past. And just like, that really means how fast or slow you can detox. And so a lot of times under methylators will be poor detoxers. So you're not able to clear or like break down toxins or clear them very well. And then 25% of the population will also have a genetic predisposition. That's called the HLA gene where you're just not able to detox mold super well either. And so I would say at least one out of four people will be more prone to being in that like really chronic mold illness state. Whereas others that, I mean, we could say with methylation, that's kind of like 50, 50, I'm like, cause I mean, both with just poor methylation and not the HLA gene will still be in a, a struggle bus situation. But a lot of the times people that are exposed to mold, once they're removed from it and they start feeling better, their, their body's able to dump it and clear it and they can move on. Um, that's a, a vast majority of people too. So it's so interesting what we see now a day is like in functional space, because there's kind of like a one size fits all approach of like, Hey, you got mold. This is how you get rid of it. But it doesn't work for everyone that way because everyone like, depending on the chronicity of it and um, just like what your body's ability to detox it, because sometimes if your body's not able to detox mold super well, and you just start taking binders or antifungals, you're not going to be able to like handle those well, because you're probably going to be detoxing into yourself. And so you have to open up your channels first, whereas one that is a bit more stealth and um, can detox on their own better. They're like, Hey, I took some binders and my not fungals. I'm done with mold. And they, they feel like that's the, the cherry on top. It's end of the story. So. Right. Well, no, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's something that we talked about off air as well, that a lot of people will will test themselves, which I want to get into the right testing, will maybe just throw on some binders and some antifungals and call it a day. And that might work. That might be all that they need. That might be enough, but then it also might exacerbate the problem. So Lauren, can you get into, first of all, I just kind of opened a can here. I want you to talk about the type of testing that you do did on yourself and that you now do on patients to yeah. determine mold within, not right. just in their home, but within their bodies. And then what kind of treatment did you do? What do you see? Um, yeah, is, what do you see is an effective treatment for mold with your patients? Yeah, hundred percent. So testing wise, it's such a wild west still, because there are uh, your mycotoxin urine tests that you can take and it'll show mold in your urine or how elevated your spores are. But the thing about these tests is like, sometimes a lot of times they are picking up like food sources, food stuffs. Like if you eat anything that's shelf stable, whether it's like, you know, rice or beans, if you're eating those or like nuts or just like, I mean, even like bars that are like, you know, these keto bars, et cetera, like anything that's been sitting for a while can contain some mold. So that is something to be aware of. And there is a test out there that'll pick up okra toxin pretty much in every single sample I run. And so I think you have to take those with a grain of salt. And a lot of times it's just really contextual that I use now, just thinking like timeline wise, where are they living? When did they start getting sick? Like, did it correlate with them moving into their house or like into the workspace yep. that they're in? Um, kind of like back to my own journey of like my health really declined when I moved on that house, like, and no one ever correlated that. So I think that a lot of times can 
paint a picture because sometimes two people run these mold tests and they've maybe been feeling sicker for longer. It's not necessarily correlated with where they're living now, or it can show mold from like years ago that they just haven't detoxed. And they were like, oh yeah, I did live in mold at one time. Like kind of you said, but mold may not be the biggest piece of the puzzle there. Okay. And so it, it has to be all, it's all about timeline and just really understanding when did I start getting sick? Mm-hmm. Symptoms wise, what are my symptoms? Like, are they so random? And also like looking for, again, those Achilles heels, like is what's being highlighted in my body, something that tends to be like my, my gut is my Achilles heel. Other people, again, hormones, other people at skin. Cause right. a lot of times that will be exacerbated first. And you, you may chalk it up to be like, I don't know why this is flaring all of a sudden, especially if you're already kind of on a, a health minded lifestyle. A lot of times too, is like where mold will be a player because it's like, I'm doing all the things, but I'm still not feeling well. That's where right. a consideration for mold could be at play. Um, from a blood work perspective, like TGF beta one, a lot of times will be exacerbated, um, C4A protein complement protein as well, which aren't typical markers that people are running. I mean, those are inflammatory markers, but there's not really like a gold standard blood test to do either. And so it's just like working with also a skilled clinician that can really help you because I think just self-diagnosing as we know, is not always like, then we just get married to the diagnosis or we're so dead set on that diagnosis and it may be something else. But that, that's what I would say on testing. And then from a house perspective or I, airborne sampling, I'd said at least sensitive is what most mold inspectors out there are going to be doing, like just in your town. So if you call mold inspection company and you ask them what like an ERMI test or a mycotoxin scan is, they're not going to know what that is. <laughs> most of them. And that's kind of like a red flag in and of itself. Just in an ERMI test and mycotoxin scan is like a cloth dust sampling that you will, since mold spores, toxic mold spores are heavy. They fall to the ground. They don't get collected in the air, okay. like um, allergens in the air. So doing a, a swipe around the house or in multiple rooms in the house, and you can isolate rooms. And then again, context clues, like, has there been any like water spots that I notice or any just like changes when I change the air, I feel differently, it, whether it's air condition or to my heat, et cetera. There was like that leaking window, for example, now I would know like if there's water anywhere, there's probably like there's the likelihood that mold can accumulate. And to the degree, it just depends a lot of times how long it's been there, like the, the quicker you find, because mold can take root like 24 to 48 hours. But if it's been like, yeah, found, you can remediate it pretty easily before it affects your whole house and your whole body. And you were, we were talking about newer builds as well. Like just because something's new does not mean it's just like mold free. And I learned that really the hard way and a great way in here in Austin, where I would go into homes, I was not renting anything older than 2017, just because I thought like newer, better. Right. And still, I would say 80%, 85% of the homes that I tested came back with toxic mold spores on these ERMI tests I was running. And granted, different climates may be different, although I do think it's not always so much about the climate anymore because I would go, I mean, to like Arizona or Colorado and be exposed to a moldy home. Like my like rainbows and butterflies philosophy was kind of crushed. And so it just, it really is dependent more so on the internal home build. And I've actually found some homes to be like that are older to be, they don't build them like they used to in a way, a bit more sturdier Mm -hmm. just from a material perspective. Cause nowadays, at least with construction here in Austin, they're putting them up so fast left and right that the craftsmanship and the time spent. So if we have like a flood rain and they don't like, they just leave the wood out or the roof is not on the house still, they just keep building on top of that without really like thinking anything about mold. We can just build it and sell it, build it and sell it. And so I would go into these even new build projects after a rain that I was like, I think you're making an offer on or something and be like, so crushed. It was like such a pretty house and such a, not a cheap house to be like, I'm not going to buy this house now. So yeah, that's, it's really got to be a dance with like, not just relying on testing. You have to like use like your timeline and, and brain power there. And also I was mentioning methylation being a piece of the puzzle too. So just like doing some genetic testing or MMA as well to figure out like what are your methylation status within your B12 on your blood work can be really helpful. Well, and and yeah, that's the thing. So can we, the the next question would be, I mean, let's say somebody bought a house and they don't want to move out, right? Yeah. (laughs) And they don't want to move. So can we shore up their bodies and can we eradicate 
the mold in the house at the same time. Yeah. Maybe they can just stay. It's possible and it's not possible in some homes. So every, it's home dependent. Like I had a, a friend, they got exposed to mold here. They built their dream home, like re gutted a whole house out like in uh, Dripping Springs area. And they, the subfloor was completely moldy. They forgot to, they did not rip that out. So everything else in the house was like completely new and they just could not understand why they were so sick still. And that house would, we call that just a bad egg because you are going to have to just basically redo the whole house because of like the magnitude of where the mold is. Whereas if it is in a, a sidewall or like it's a part of the house that you can remediate it out, then it is possible. And, right. and then as far as like, yeah, we're like shore your body up. I do think it is possible like to live. We are going to be exposed to mold just in our daily life, just the way of the beast. And so I think the more that you can heal the inside, the more resilient you're going to be to the elements and able to withstand where, like I was kind of saying, like I'm able to now be exposed and acknowledge it and not go into that fight or flight. So I think like you have to do some of that legwork first in order to be able to like be in it. And a lot of times too, there can be correlation from just a, a brain Olympic level. If it was maybe the home that, that I got most sick in, which I was renting, thankfully didn't own it, but I don't think it would, it would be a lot for my limbic brain. I would have to do a lot of training to get back into that home just because of the correlation. So if you can like, kind of like uncorrelate your old experience with the, a new experience, if you've had to like go through the whole mold remediation, move out and move back in, I think that work needs to be addressed as well in order to help you be more resilient in your space. Okay. I like that. You're taking that full body approach for sure. Yeah. yeah. And now you bring brain. your own story and your own experience. I mean, from health to home, experience oh, yeah. to your client. So do you really, how do you address someone that you feel now that you've been through what you've been through, that you feel that mold is definitely involved here? You know, we see all of the, and I'll, I'll just, okay, I'll just give you straight up a person that'll be listening to this podcast. It'll be the, the thyroid patient, the hormone patient that, yeah, we see those levels are off. There's no doubt we have to address the low T3, we have to address the low testosterone, but then at the same time, you would come in and do what in terms of the mold? Yeah. So it is like a full body approach because, and like holistic lifestyle approach too, because we have to assess like, you know, where's the, what's the environment that's triggering you right now. And so, and what is the magnitude of the problem? Like, again, is it a whole house thing that like we do need to move and remediate, or is it like a contained thing, but you've been exposed and you're able to live in the home and we can remediate it there, whatever the the thing is from the home perspective, we've got to address the environment first, because you have to be in a place that you at least feel like you can be safe and you can do some healing in, and mm -hmm. it may be your home and it may not be the home. And so that being a first piece of the puzzle, sometimes I'll have clients just go on a sabbatical or they'll decide to like, Hey, I'm going to rent an Airbnb for three months or something like that, that like gets them at least removed or they may go stay with family somewhere and just to kind of like see if they can feel differently too. And that being that piece. And then from a just health perspective, I really start with foundation. So one of my very favorite questions to ask my clients at the end of our work together is what helped you the most in your healing? Never once has one said a laundry list of supplements or a restrictive elimination diet. It's always something to do with like lifestyle and, and, or stress or like both and that being unique to them. And so like one client, it was like, you know, connection, like having uh, more community and people back in their life because it mold is so isolating. Another, it's been like really connecting with like, or just getting outside, <laughs> being outside more in like sun for me, like sauna was a big piece for me. Yeah. That was helpful for just detoxing. It's something I, I still do as it was yoga. Just, let's kind of get out of that fight or flight. And so I hope individuals find like something or some things that are going to be helpful on that path. And then a lot of times I'll be, I'll do a supplement detox with them because they'll come. A lot of people come to me already with their like bag and of everything. Bag, and the bag, the, the list. The bag, yeah. I know. 
I had boxes actually, like whole storage container boxes full of them. And seen it the all. day that I threw them out, like kerplunk, I heard in the, the garbage can. It was just like, I felt so free and liberated. And so I'll do that with clients a lot of times. And then we just start on like, we have to open up the pathways and open up the channels so your body can detox on its own while also simultaneously beginning to build up the good gut bug army I talk about because we have to make the gut more resilient and that's going to be a process before we do any like heavy duty detoxing. And even if you've already been down the like functional, like I have had a client that had been detoxing from mold for like 11 years and from Lyme and like he keeps doing antifungal treatments and I'm like, he yeah. needed to take a break from those because his gut bog army is really destroyed. And so and when I talk about opening up the pathways, like you have seven detox pathway channels that like from your liver to your gallbladder, your lymphatics, your circulatory system, your kidneys, your skin, your gut bacteria alone are, and then your colon, like your just gut are all detox pathways that we have to make sure are clearing. So if you're not pooping every day, for example, we need to make sure that's happening because like, you're going to again, detox into yourself. Right. And I do this, I mean, simultaneously with some lifestyle practices. So things, whether it's sauna, dry brushing, um, if one lives near the ocean, like sea salt, <laughs> even like the, the float tanks can be really helpful. I personally didn't handle a lot of supplements with the mast cell. And so I work with a lot of sensitive folks. A lot of times there's some homeopathy I'll bring in. I tend to find that very, be gentler for opening up drainage pathways. So making sure you're draining and then with the gut microbiome, I'll oftentimes just do a really well-tolerated, whether it's a spore-based probiotic or de-lactate-free probiotic to begin building that up. And then within the diet front, just really my, my goal is to be the least restrictive as possible with clients. And so to help them overcome like those food intolerances and food fears and really working just individually with them on like what foods those look like. Sometimes like kind of a gaps approach, like with as far as like broths can be really helpful if you're not tolerating a lot or um, stocks, even if you're not tolerating broth because of the histamine, mm -hmm. DAO enzymes can be really helpful for people that have histamine responses. Mm -hmm. So just this integral, like foundation building period is really, we got to set the body up to be able to like detox better. And then, yeah, just back to again, the lifestyle and the stress less. Like actually I was such a pooper on yoga before mold. Like I just didn't have time for it. I needed CrossFit yeah. every day. And so it was like actually such a saving grace. And I found power yoga. I love power yoga still. Wait, you like, got it. It's gotta be the vibe. power. It's exactly. Be I'm still not a yin yoga person, but I did find yoga and that was super helpful. So helping people find that mind body practice. And then what was such a huge catalyst? And I am integrating this now earlier than later because it was actually on the back end of my journey that helped everything skyrocket is the gut brain retraining and gut brain work, or some people will call it limbic system retraining. I didn't have the capacity. There's some programs out there that like, they say you have to do an hour a day practice and you have to watch these videos. And I'm just like, my attention span at the time was not able to do that. And so inadvertently, I learned this um, during a training I was in as a practitioner for just some like limbic work to help my clients in general. And I didn't realize how much it would help myself. And so it's definitely something I integrate now and just some gut brain rewiring sessions that I'll do with clients that are just really pivotal in helping you understand what is the root cause conflicts that your brain is correlating with mold. And in order to distill and get out of that fight or flight, we, we know the body keeps the score. And so, and a lot of times like our issues are in our tissues. And so even just releasing, we call them the big six negative emotions and learning how to do that, um, which would be anger, fear, sadness, hurt, guilt, and shame. And individually I worked through those. And now that's something that I'll, I'll integrate. So it's just like, mind blowing how much of a red carpet that can be to healing. And, um, so yeah, that is foundations. And then we can move into talking like, you know, detox, then the person's ready. If yep. ready, like I honestly never took a binder in my whole detox journey. They would constipate me very quickly. And so I tended to use more like soluble fibers that are just like prebiotic in nature for one. So continue to build up my good gut bugs and helping yep. me also with poo, uh, regularly. Yep. And then probiotic therapy actually was very impactful. And I think that's something very underrated. And again, back to my love for the gut, I was just like, you know, there's so much research out there that when the gut is in a healthy state, just look on PubMed and you'll see hundreds of thousands of studies now, whatever your pathway is. And so just 
took a, a broad spectrum shotgun approach to just dressing my gut and, and rebuilding it back to be stronger. And that, that really helped me overcome. And then I guess on the back end. So if you do antifungals or binders, like on the back end, you still are going to want to rebuild the gut. Yeah. And that would be kind of like the third piece of that puzzle. Well, when you say the probiotic, would you say like a probiotic? What was your word? Uh, probiotic therapy? Therapy. Maybe. I've yeah. never heard of probiotic therapy. So are you talking about bringing in different strains of probiotics? Because I'm a huge proponent of, here's what I can't stand. And I know that you'll agree with me. We didn't even talk about this. The people that are taking Activia day yeah. in and day <laughs> out because they read that a probiotic is good for them. I'm like, wait a minute. You have so many trillions of good bacteria and you're only feeding a couple billion guys. Like that's yeah. it. Like you're yeah. starving out the rest of the troops here. So when you say probiotic therapy, are you talking about like cycling different ones in and out? Yeah. And I yeah. have just have like really quality standards. Like there's like a, maybe 90 Five percent of probiotics on shelves don't contain the probiotics they claim, or nor are they like effective and yeah. just at an effective dose. So, like, you, I I was very high dosing uh, probiotics. Like, you need at least a hundred billion strains. Most on shelves are going to have ten to fifty. Yep. What I found, and then a lot of them are going to also be very lactic acid based, meaning like a lot of times people with histamine issues or SIBO already, it's just going to exacerbate it. You're just pouring more like flame on the fire, fuel on the fire. Whereas like triple bar, triple probiotic therapy would be like a combination of like your bifidolactic species, but a good like delactate free is what it's called a spore base. And then a Saccharomyces boulardii, which is actually like a yeast, but I uh, use those just synergistically. And then sometimes bringing in like short chain fatty acids and prebiotics. I try to get those mostly in the diet, even though like just like soluble fibers. And I've said soluble a couple of times. Soluble just means like is gel-like in nature and it's just better dissolved and absorbed. A lot of times people will say I eat vegetables and I feel more bloated or like the FODMAP sensitivities that are out there with a lot of like cruciferous, et cetera. Whereas opposed to like, if you can think about a really well-cooked vegetable in general, but like real cooked carrots, soluble, mm -hmm. like winter squashes, summer squashes, greens, like cooked down. So I was doing a lot of just like foods that were easier to digest as well as fed healthy probiotics. So that's kind of like my approach from a gut perspective. No, totally. And I wanted you to expand on that because I didn't want people to think that they could just go out and take probiotics. Oh, yes, exactly. Call it a day. I mean, you're looking yeah. at the food sources, you're looking at the prebiotic, the probiotic, the type of fiber it is. So it's a whole, it's a whole protocol. I mean, okay. we could have you back on to talk about the limbic system and, yeah, you know, that whole connection to every disease. We could have you back on just this hot gut. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing how many different, we could go down a lot of different rabbit holes. We really, <laughs> I know I oftentimes say it's like, I went through like underground medical school for like oh, 25 years, just with my own health journeys. And just like, I'm so thankful for it now because it just forced me to learn lessons the hard way. And now I'm here to teach others and help here to help heal. It did. It did. That's why we, so many of us are here is, no, through, you know, seriously. absolutely you get into it. So if you could tell anyone out there that is thinking that mold might be an issue, might, might be an issue, or maybe they have a test. They're like, mold is an issue. What would you, what advice would you give them right now? Yeah, I would, I mean, kind of back to my first point, it's like just knowing there is an end in sight. Like this is not, I have to define you. And I think to methodically approach it, I would say not going it alone is very helpful. And so connecting with someone like yourself or a practitioner, like just that does this work and like is helpful to support one just holistically. Right. And then as I've kind of addressed here, just like you got to focus on those foundations first. So like pooping is going to be essential. Sweating is going to be essential. Breathing is going to be essential. I think those are just great detox, ex like exhaling, <laughs> pooing, and then excreting through sweat um, oh. ways to kind of like get started. Well, people don't realize that that is a detox. Like when yeah. you, when you breathe out, exactly. you are detoxifying something. Is and it's free. Totally. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. But no, if they are interested in working with you, cause you've walked the walk. Yeah. You help many others walk the walk. Many, many, many. How can they find you? 
Yeah, definitely reach out. Um, DrLauren.com is my website and as is my handle on Instagram and I'm pretty active over there. So, and Lauren is the Y in it. So D-R-L-A-U-R-Y-N. And yeah, send me a message. I do have a, a booking link where we can do a complimentary consult on both my website and on my Instagram link. And so we'd be happy to connect and just like help you game plan and problem solve what the next best step could be. Yeah, we'll put all the links in the show notes, but yeah. you also have a, a mold survival guide. I do. Oh, yeah. yes. I have we'll that, that on my website as well. Yep. So we'll we'll link to that as well. So people can at least start there, grab that, and and then know how to take the next step. So Dr. Yeah. Lauren, thank you so much. Thank you again for jumping on. Thank you for coming back. And thank you for sharing your story and all of your knowledge about mold. All things mold. Thanks all for having mold. me. I love chatting with you, Amy. You're awesome. Absolutely, my dear. Well, we will definitely have you back on to talk about all the other things too. I love it. This yeah. sounds like a plan.